Hello. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, thank you very much to Zach and the Virtual Festival of Facades for hosting AESG for this talk. Um, and today we'll be talking about man versus machine, uh, digitizing facade design. Um, really what we mean by this, or, or in other words, it's about moving from the more analog process that we take in terms of developing facades uh, and developing design of, of architecture and buildings and moving towards a more digital, more calculated, um, computerized approach um, to, to design, architecture and facades. Uh, I'll be joined today by Marina Kinderlan, uh, who's an associate at AESG within our facade engineering team. Um, and Marina is going to take on the, the latter part of the conversation where she'll be talking through um, some examples of, of how we've been investing uh, within AESG and within our facade team into utilizing digital technologies to optimize the way uh, that we, we approach facade design and facade engineering. I'm going to start a little bit off topic here um, and jump straight into it with, um, with the automotive industry. Um, the automotive industry is perhaps the most everyday um, of all machines uh, in our daily lives. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite fascinating in terms of the hugely transformational evolution which the automotive industry has taken over the past 100 years. Um, if I go back to even before the Model T, uh, which was uh, obviously in invented by uh, Henry Ford in 1908, uh, we were looking at horse-drawn cart, uh, then steam-powered uh, powered cars, followed by um, the combustion engine uh, towards the end of, of the 1800s. Um, and then the, the huge transformational evolution that took place um, again after the in introduction of the combustion engine was by Henry Ford through automation and, and through mass production. Um, what he was able to do was actually reduce the price of the car uh, by a factor of six, um, which was which was huge. And what it did was it, it allowed the masses to have access um, to vehicles and to transport. And it, it, it was transformational um, in terms of everybody's everyday lives um, across America and across Europe um, and beyond. Um, looking further afield now, we're again right in the middle of, again, one of these transformational shifts um, and evolutionary shifts in um, in the automotive industry with uh, with the electric vehicle, um, autonomous driving, with the internet of things, um, connectivity. And, and this is really, again, another major milestone uh, in the automotive industry. Um, comparably to that, the design, construction, engineering industry um, has been massively under um, transformational in its approach to um, to design, to engineering, even to construction, um, where we've really failed to grasp and adapt huge leaps in efficiency and in production. Um, and what this makes us realize is that if there is any industry at the moment that is, I suppose, ripe for transformation, it, it really is the, um, the architecture, engineering and construction fields and construction industry. Um, despite the fact that construction has been around a lot longer than automotives, um, we are still following very, very similar processes to design and engineering. Um, despite the introduction of you know, computer-aided design with BIM, um, we're still producing just as much information. Buildings take just as long, really, to design and develop uh, with very similar amounts of effort. Um, and so this is really what we're talking about today, machine-led or algorithmic-led um, led design. This is a project that, uh, that, that we've been working on actually for a client. It was in the pre-concept stage. Uh, where they were looking at the massing um, available across their, their site in terms of the streets, the courtyards, the clustering, the heights. And what we're really able to do is run through hundreds of iterations um, in a very, very short space of time. Um, a number of iterations that are well beyond uh, the human capacity to interpret, to calculate, to evaluate. Um, but by using predetermined uh, input parameters, we're able to run simulations and assess what is actually the, the, the prime or the, the most optimum output um, based on the client's uh, appreciation of, of um, some of those input parameters. What this really allows us to do is to gain huge advancements in speed, in time, in cost in developing designs and developing more optimal designs. 
Um, that also allows for improvements in performance. It allows for things like minimization of waste through rationalization of, let's say, um, glazing, glazing panels, for instance. And it can also provide things like improvement in, in well-being by optimizing daylight uh, distribution into the depth or towards the core um, of a building. Um, these are just some of the examples of, of these gains in efficiency. Um, and you know, this is in terms of design, but the same also applies in terms of construction, in terms of materials um, and beyond. And that's really why we see the, the, the possibility with generative design, um, with computational design as being so huge. Really, when you look at the number of iterations that you're able to run, this is the general sort of process that we follow. Uh, and, and this is only going to become more and more powerful over time as these algorithms uh, are fed more data, um, as this becomes more and more regular use uh, within the, the uh, engineering and, and construction industry. Um, but really by taking a, a model and having your, um, you know, your sort of business use that you want, um, you can take a baseline and you can run through multiple parameters, multiple simulations and assessments um, easily well within the thousands of different iterations of a design to output uh, your recommended design. With that in mind, I'm going to hand over to, to Marina to actually give you some, some real world examples um, of, of doing that. Now, to give you a, a little bit of background, on AESG. Uh, we are a specialist uh, engineering firm. Um, we focus on multiple specialisms within, within our company. Um, and really what we see is that through a culture of collaboration within the specialisms, we can add a huge amount of value to, to buildings. So um, if I take something such as uh, the facade engineering team that we have, our building performance and sustainability team, our acoustics team, our fire and life safety teams, um, by overlapping those, by knitting those together, we're actually able to produce highly efficient, highly sustainable, highly cost-effective buildings um, through collaboration, communication, and innovation in those. And that's really why digital innovation and digital transformation within the construction engineering sector is so important to us. Um, we see ourselves as a specialism in these areas of needing to be at the forefront um, of these technologies, um, because this really is the future of, of, of the work that we're doing. Um, to touch on one very important point there, I think the, uh, the role of the architect in the future is much more likely um, to come from a programming background as opposed to coming from a design-led background. Um, and that's really important to us because that is very much about our own internal future leaders program about bringing um, computer scientists into the business that in the future uh, will be leading uh, the approach that we take to generative and computer-led uh, digital design. Our facade engineering team uh, work throughout the, uh, the facade life cycle um, of a project going from early feasibility stages and, and uh, sort of pre-concept or conceptual um, studies, um, taking that through wind load studies, thermal analyses, structural analysis, um, preparation of detailed design packages, detailed drawing specifications, um, but then we also support throughout the construction phase. Um, the testing and, and, uh, and mock-ups um, and also take that on to uh, then the handover, the operational phase of buildings and then also into uh, refurbishment uh, projects, retrofits, recladding um, and investigation works for buildings. Uh, a very interesting example actually of where we've been uh, recently using the, uh, the parametric and the uh, uh, digital team within, within AESG has actually been for this project which is Seal Tower. Um, Seal Tower will be the largest hotel in the world. Um, AESG were entirely responsible for the facade package and the facade design on this building. Um, it's currently under construction in, in Dubai Marina, um, so it'll be around about 350 meters tall. And it's, uh, it's a double curved facade. Um, no easy feat to construct a building like this within uh, the constraints of budget and within the constraints of time, um, but something that we were able to do by using these digital design tools. Um, here is a quick snapshot from uh, our approach on this. And really, the, uh, we, we had two objectives. One, um, which was ensuring that we don't exceed the maximum amount of warp or deviation um, for the glazing panels. The second goal was to rationalize uh, the number of, uh, of unique panels um, on the facade. And we're able to do this by using parametric tools um, which is common practice now uh, with, within, the, uh, um, within the facade engineering world, but something that uh, is leading more and more into actually utilizing these, uh, these scripts to optimize the way that, that buildings are being done. 
With that in mind, I'm going to be handing over to um, Marina Kinderlan, um, who will now be talking you through an example um, within AESG uh, based on solar radiation and the approach that we've taken to run through um, the overlap of facade, sustainable design, technology, um, and, uh, and how we were able to use parametric tools to, uh, to optimize um, solar radiation for, for a building, for a project. Thank you very much, Scott. So now what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to present a case study where we show how the facade engineering and facade sustainability engineers, together with the parametric specialists, can produce an optimized design or can support uh, the optimization of a design. So mainly our key tool is the advanced computational design. The way that this works is that through a generative design, we are able to run thousands of, thousand of uh, cases and get the optimized ones. So this way, we get the better results. In this case, we base all this generative design and our analysis and case study on the solar radiation. Because working together with the sustainability team, we realize how important is the solar in terms of the passive solar design and also the active solar technologies affecting the facade. So when we talk about the solar passive uh, design, we refer to the use of sun energy for the heating and cooling of living spaces by exposure to the sun. So in this case, we need to take in account the climatic conditions, the compass orientation, inclination, size of openings, sun protection like louver screens, etc. And as an active te solar technology, we are talking about using electrical or mechanical devices to actually convert solar energy into another form of energy, most often heat or electricity. That can be done with thermal solar collectors or photovoltaic systems. We are going to be more focused on the photovoltaic systems as part of the facade. So as we explained before, the way that we are talking or what we are doing and in this case study is uh, how to optimize the massing or the facade in early design stages. So the way that this works is that first we try to optimize with the design team the massing, then we go to the facade and then later on with the how to use um, active, active uh, solar, uh, how to use the active solar radiation. So the way that this uh, generative design works is um, having some fixed parameters, variable parameters, and the optimized design, the target that we are uh, wanting to reach. So if we are talking about the massing optimization as fixed parameters, we can consider mainly the project brief. So that comes with the maximum square meters, the plot, uh, the plot restrictions, the climatic and local conditions, and then we will have some variable parameters. These are to be discussed with the design team, but can be orientation, inclination, steps, height of the buildings, as many variables as, as the plot and the project brief give us. And then the key thing is to, to, to set up the targets, to know what is the optimized design that we are looking for. It can be the energy performance, the solar radiation, shape shading of the building for out of thermal comfort. So, the key thing is to set up these targets properly. So in this case study, as a baseline, it's a really simple one. What we wanted to prove is how with this optimized design, we can improve uh, the solar radiation and, and reduce their solar radiation. So we have this case study that is with the fixed parameters, with the climatic and local conditions. In this case, we have based in Abu Dhabi, the site, the plot uh, site uh, size, the maximum square meters, in this case, 50,000 square meters, the maximum height. So what we have done is extruded the plot, the maximum surface allow, and extruded to the, the height so to achieve 50,000 square meters. So as you can see, the solar radiation getting in this one is 14,725 megawatts per hour. So now then, is when we use this generative design. In this case, we have those uh, fixed parameters. Then now we play with the orientation. And the targets that we are looking for is to have better energy performance and reduce the solar radiation. So 
the output of this is the most efficient or um, the optimized orientation. This one is giving us, as you can see, a solar radiation or of 40,215 megawatts per hour. That means about 500 megawatts per hour less. And this is just changing the orientation. What about if now, as the variable parameters, we include the heights and the number of buildings? And then again, the targets are still the same, energy performance and solar radiation. What is happening? So what you can see is now we are talking about that the solar radiation is 2,988 megawatts per hour. So it's almost around 2,000 megawatts per hour less. So this is just a basic study, like a case study, how to improve the massing, like how to do a massing optimization. What about if to this massing, now we do an optimized facade? So in this case, we will go to the same one. A, we will have the fixed parameter, then we will have the variable parameters and the optimized design. In this case, in the fixed parameters, we will have the building massing, the orientation is already a fixed parameter because we have decided in the previous steps. And also the climatic and local conditions still the same. Now the, the variable parameters can be the window duration, the height and width of the openings, shading elements, reveals, light cells, louvers, and again, the optimized design. These are the targets that we need to put together, like we need to decide it. Is it because we want to improve the daylight, void glare, improve the energy performance? So all of this goes on the generative design again. So having the shading elements in this case, as a variable parameter for all the facades. Actually, what it gives us is that if the most exposed facades, if we protect those exposed facades with the shading elements, we get a solar, a solar radiation reduction up to the 10,975 megawatts per hour. So that means there is a difference between the original design, the base case, the baseline of 4,000 megawatts per hour. So, here is kind of like the summary of this quick exercise to explain how this process works. From the baseline, applying the optimized orientation, optimized massing, and optimized facade, we are able to reduce a 23% of in the solar radiation. So this, this methodology, this system we have applied to different scales. We have done in a master plan scale, so using the sun path orientation, sunlight hours, solar radiation, accumulative radiation, and wind growth to be able to have an optimized configuration of the master plan. Being more specific on the facade, we have done this um, optimization of the facade on a case. As you can see on the left side, that was like the architectural intent. Uh, as a fixed parameter, it was the geometry of the window. They want this like um, two height um, curtain wall with these opaque panels with some rebuilds. So the variables in this project discussed with the design team, it was the spacing between the windows, the depth of the rebuilds, and then the light cells. So what, what it does, this computer program is mainly for its orientation. In this case, southeast, southwest, northeast, and northwest run the different window spacing, select the most adequate one related on the daylight and the glare, then apply the different options for the reveals, select the most appropriate one, and then introduce the light self. So as you can see on the radiation metric, you can see how this is improving. On another application in a mass radia, also part of the facade, uh, we study and we managed to get a parametric design that responds to the internal use and the solar radiation incidation in each of the facades. So the same as Ravia in this case is a project in, in Karachi, Pakistan. There is a residential tower with this much Ravia in the four of the orientations of the tower. So each of the orientations, the density of it, it responds to the solar radiation in each of the facades and also the use behind it. So with, uh, with the input of those parameters, plus the input of the constraints of having a precast uh, mass radia, 
we managed to get these different options and the most optimal densities for each of the um, orientations. Another application, it was in a canopy. This is almost, I would say, as a master plan scale. When it's a, this is an um, office and um, commercial area street, where like they, they wanted to, we have highlighted the radiation uh, during the peak times in the summer. It was really high, so we wanted to reduce this to introduce in a canopy. But it's a canopy that also kind of respond to the to the orientation of the buildings, the facade, and also trying to avoid um, problems with the daylight on the offices below those that canopy. So what it has been designed is that taking into account all the variables and having as a fixed parameters, the climate condition and the daylight requirements, mainly we play with the perforation of this canopy to, to achieve the better performance. As, as you can see here, we managed to a percent difference of the 46% in terms of the average radiation per square meter. This is not just applicable in terms of the massing of or just the facade design. We, we also use it in terms of that renewable energy in the building. So for solar radiation, as I was saying, this exercise, we are focusing mainly on the solar radiation. It's not just how to protect the building from solar radiation, it's also how to take energy from it. So using in, there's two methods to, um, to have the renewable energy on the building from the solar radiation is the th solar thermal and the photovoltaic. If we focus on the photovoltaic, the PV and the VIPV applicability in the building, there is like a lot of options. There is like the, the cladding as part of louvers, balconies, roof, facades, uh, roof uh, canopies. So mainly the key thing is like to be able to design for those elements to be part of the design, not to be something added later on. This happening one of our projects and we we through our methodology again same is the optimizing and early design stages so we have the fixed parameters the variable parameters and optimize so in this case for example the fixed parameters will be the massing and location then and the climate and local conditions then the variable parameters are the angle orientation and quantity of those panels and the optimized design the targets in this case, it's the solar radiation and the energy that it can be achieved from these panels. So this is a, a project that I was mentioning. We were during the really early stages where we have realized, of course, in the south facing of the building, solar radiation it was quite high. So part of the discussion with the design team it was how to protect that facade from the solar radiation. So the design team came with this canopy that you can see on the right side and how to protect it. And then part of the conversation, it got to a point that what about if that canopy also has PVs? So at the same time it's protecting, the building is also generating energy. So as part of this optimization massing, but applicable in this case for PVs, we got the early design from the architects, from the with the design team and then we realized as you can see on the left image that it was so much radiation on the top part that the lower part it was overshading so actually the, the pv panels would not um, achieve any energy performance from it so we start to run options massaging this this massing and again to manage to get the optimal size and shape of it without need, needing to cover that much so as you can see on the right side the size of this canopy has reduced just to the area that needs to be covered from this uh, radiation and also can absorb as much as possible and is more efficient. I think in this slide it's more clear about the efficiency. So as you can see, if you compare from the baseline to the iteration too, we managed to get a, a percent increase of the radiation up to a 20, I mean, of the radiation per panel to up to 28%. And the area of the canopy, it has reduced up to a 33, almost a 33%. So with less area, we achieve more energy. So this is mainly, as you can see, it's clear on the, on the diagram here, is that 
with the ori right orientation, right shape of the canopy, right distance and orientation of the PV panels, we maximize the performance of those panels. So it was important to analyze the different angles for the different locations of the canopy because this canopy was curved. Also the distance between the, the PV panels to avoid any overshade. And at the end, this is after like some coordination, this it was the optimized design. Thank you, Marina. We're just going to finish um, now on this on this slide, which really just gives you a bit of an indication um, of the impact of utilizing uh, a more optimized design. Um, so the National Renewable Energy Laboratory have shown how um, actually we can cut conventional buildings by half. Um, and then by integrating renewable and efficient technologies, we're actually able to cut that by half still. Um, and so the story that we've talked you through today, the example that we've spoken through, um, is a prime example of what we need to be doing now uh, going forwards across the board. Um, in the move and the shift towards net zero buildings, more climate resilient buildings in the wake of climate change, we need to be very conscious of the need and the drivers to produce these more efficient buildings. Um, and I hope what you have seen today is just how uh, helpful and um, essential um, digital design tools and automation uh, against part of the design that we do uh, is to the uh, to, to ensuring that we are um, we are able to uh, to meet uh, the goals that we need in terms of building energy performance and efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, should you have any questions, please feel free to to reach out to us at AESG, um, and we'll be more than happy to uh, to help. Thank you.